It's a pleasure to introduce these three luminaries in the environmental world. Um, we have Dr. Mallison from Friends of the Earth. Um, Declan won't mind me saying this, but it was meant to be um, the SDLP politician, um, Claire Halla. Um, Declan has been with Friends of the Earth and will speak specifically in relation to climate change and the importance of staying within the European Union. Declan has been friends with Friends of the Earth since the Edwardian times. <laughs> um, Tanya Jones is a Green Party um, politician. She's a student from Anna South Tyrone, did incredibly well. Tanya is very <coughs> fluent about issues around fracking, issues around social justice, and um, the benefits for staying within the uh, European Union. She's also an author, very accomplished. She's actually written a book on climate change, a novel on climate change. Fracking. Which, fracking yes. climate change. Yes. Um, which I actually read. How sad is that? But it's a <laughs> wonderful book. Uh, finally, we have uh, Stanley Johnson. Stanley is co-chair of Environment Environmentalists for Europe. Stanley has had a really distinguished career in terms of environmental law. He's been an, an MEP uh, for many years. He, he was a contemporary of uh, John Hume and Ian Paisley and his many witty anecdotes. He won't mind me saying that he's never been in Belfast before, although he doesn't think he's been in Belfast before. <laughs> um, yeah, and one of the things that we, we harp on about all the time within Friends of the Earth is, my goodness, what, where would we be without the Environmental Impact Assessments Directive, the Birds Directive, the Habitats Directive? I don't know if you saw the program last night on Spotlight in relation to the GA Stadium and issues associated with that. The reason why the local residents won that case was specifically because they invoked certain provisions of the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive. And I'm not saying this just to pander to, to Stanley, but his involvement in the European community over 20 years was absolutely pivotal in trying to get this legislation through and succeeding in getting the legislation through. And I think it's fair to say he is the architect of many of these directives, particularly the Habitats Directive that is um, very close to Friends of the Earth Heart. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, each panelist will be giving about eight minutes each to, to speak, and then there'll be opportunities at the end for uh, a lively discussion and debate. Thanks very much. So Stanley Johnson, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And yeah, you're 100% right. I can't believe it. I've travelled around the world endlessly. I've been to Antarctica, I've been to the Pacific, I've been to Asia. Heaven's sake, this is the first time I have been to Belfast. In my dreams, of course. I've been here many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a dream come true today. And one of the people, just superb. Where have I come from? come from London, but way back I came from a farm on Exmoor. I've still got that farm, 70 years on, I've still got it. It's a wonderful piece of nature right in the heart of the moor. And that is why I think years ago I became an environmentalist. And yes, you're right, James, I was in Brussels. I was there for 15 years. I was in the European Parliament for five years. So yes, 20 years of my life have been spent on these environmental issues. So why now? Am I really pushing this? Because I do not want this referendum to go on, to come to a conclusion without it being absolutely clear that it's not just a question of the economic issues. Of course the economic issues are terrifically important. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the economic issues are not important. But when you see day after day that you know, the argument appears to be whether, after Brexit, we will be £4,300 worse off or £3,400 worse off. You say to yourself, come on, come on. The issue is more important than that. There are issues to do with sovereignty. There are, above all, are issues to do with immigration. There are issues to do with the direction of travel. And I would say that there are also social and environmental issues which do need to be taken into account. Now, on the environment, which is where we are today, yes, we have had, over 20 years now, a great raft of EU legislation. Of course, the UK absolutely contributed 
to that legislation, not just because I was there you know, drafting it, but because the UK officials came. That was vital. But the UK also realized, I'm thinking UK in, in general terms now, but UK, of course, meaning the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So I'm using the UK absolutely deliberately to include, to include Northern Ireland. We rapidly realized, I think, that actually the impetus which came from Brussels was crucial. It was crucial in cleaning up, for example, the beaches. Years ago, almost one of the first things I did when I went to Brussels in 1973 was to write a directive which was called the quality of, of bathing water. Um, we had to draft it in those days in French, so I drafted a thing. It was called Eau de Baignade. Then I went to the council, I put on my earphones, and I listened to the interpreter saying, today we have the first directive of the commission on, and then I listened in and said, on the quality of bath water. <laughs> <laughs> so you get, you know, you have to sort you have to swap these things out. The quality of bath water. But anyway, the quality of bath water turned out to be a really important directive because as a result of that, the beaches of Britain have been unbelievably improved with the quality of the seawater. In the old days, I'm sure it's not true here, but in the old days, if you were in London and you decided I'll go to, I'll go to Brighton for the weekend, I'll have a swim. Well, the reality was, in the 70s, soon after we joined the EU, then it was the EEC, you didn't swim in Brighton, you went through the motions. You didn't swim, you went through the motions. And anyway, we cleaned up the beaches, Blackpool Beach. You were probably getting the pollution from Blackpool over here. I bet you Blackpool's quite near. Northern Ireland, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 He's only got the pollution from Sellafield. I can tell you. We cleaned up the beaches, we cleaned up the air. Of course, there's a long way to go. And one of the reasons, by the way, the British high stack policy got, got, got changed was because the Germans complained. Our air, you know, we pumped up our air fluid into the air and of course floated over to Germany where it killed all the forests. You know, the black forest. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it was absolutely vital to handle some of these things on an EU-wide level, and I was particularly pleased to be involved, above all, in the nature protection side of things. Now, here you are in this wonderful country of Northern Ireland, with something like 8% of your territory is actually protected under the Habitat Directive and the Birds Directive, and you have these fantastic sites. Like Loch Ness. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Perfect. Is that okay? Loch Ness? I didn't think I could spell it. L O U L O U G H N W E. No. <laughs> that is just vital. And just look at that for a second. Look, I don't want to cast any you know, aspersions on anybody, but my understanding is that something like 15 million tons of sand have been extracted from Loch Ness since its designation as a protected area. Why has that happened? Well, what good news it is to me, James, and to you, Detroit, to learn that the Friends of the Earth, Northern Ireland, and others have actually now initiated action with the European Commission, with the European Court of Justice. Now, you may all say, well, can't we look after our um, land ourselves. And I say, isn't it useful to have this extra legal layer of protection we can appeal to? Isn't it really useful? Honestly, I think it is. Because what seems to be going on at the moment there shouldn't be going on. And the UK government, which is actually the responsible government under the Habitat Strategy, is not taking the measures it ought to be taking. So I say to you, well done. Go ahead and think twice before you call on Britain to leave the EU when you vote on June the 23rd, because you may lose the protection of the Habitat Directive. You may, by the way, also, and I'll stop in a moment, I think I, 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 I don't want to go beyond my eight minutes, you may also lose other very important protections. And I just want to toss in one as I came over today. I read the Irish Times. I know the Irish Times you know, doesn't necessarily feature on everybody's breakfast table, but there was a fantastically good article by these three Irish ladies who would say, come on, 
arrest us if you like, send us to prison if you like. We are jolly well going to buy these pills, you know, which will help. You know, all these ladies, three of them, I saw them in the paper, they were well into their 60s. So the pills aren't going to help them. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's for sure. But nevertheless, they're ready to go to prison. They are ready to go to prison. Why? Because the law which applies is the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act. You don't even have the 1967, Britain's 1967 Act. So all I'm saying is, think twice before you throw away also that layer of protection and progressiveness, which may come from continuing to be a part of the European institutions. In this case, it's not just the European Commission, the European Court, the European Community. It's also the European Council and the Council of Europe, which is the author and resident recipient of the, of the um, Convention on Human Rights. So I'm not trying to make a political speech. I'm really not. I'm not trying to tell you which way to vote, because you will put a lot of things together. And if you were to listen to my son, Boris, you would say, vote leave. I think Boris is brilliant. I think he's done the most fantastic job. I mean, he has energized this whole debate. And my line is, let there be a victory for the Remain campaign. But let it be a narrow victory. And let believers, you know, led by Boris with such energy, then join in the, the long-term battle which we have, which is actually to reform the EU, where we haven't really even begun. I've been married, actually I've been married twice. The first time was about 30 years, and the second time was about 45 years. Um, so I feel I've been married most of my life. The king of blips in the middle. But anyway, I thought to myself today as I came on, thinking about what to say. You know, if you've been married to someone for 40 years, 45 years, you don't have a divorce just because one tip because you left the wet towel on the bar and on the bed, or something like that. You know, for heaven's sake. You know, you've got to give it a go. And my, my line is, yes, let's fight this out to the end. But let, let us win, as we let the remainders win. And then let us utilize everybody's energy to actually change the key things about the Europe which need to be changed. And I'd say that is above all now the immigration rules. And I've got to say it, the Eurozone, the impact of the Eurozone as it is presently gauged. There we go. I hope I haven't been more than eight minutes. Thank you very much, James. Bye. where other species live is where we ourselves live too. As environmentalists, we're fundamentally concerned with making this place, this land, this air, this water, safe for our fellow humans as well as for other living beings. So what does European membership mean for that task? And first of all, where would we be without it? The English common law, as operational across most of these islands, is individualistic, property-based, and economically libertarian. An Englishman's home is his castle, especially if it happens to be, well, a castle. He, she, and increasingly often it, with the growth of corporate power, is free to do anything that isn't specifically prohibited, which sounds great. Only to do many of those things that people want to do the things that make the money, you need physical power, your own or somebody else's, officially sanctioned property rights and economic resources. And undoing those things is quite a different matter. You can pollute a river with no difficulty at all, but you can't unpollute it quite so easily. When one landowner's freedom to do exactly as he pleases interferes with another landowner's freedom to do exactly as he pleases, the common law will adjudicate. But it generally won't help the poor peasant who suffers as a result of either, or both. 
and the development of the law of negligence, which has filled in so many gaps in the old common law, isn't much help in environmental cases either. It requires demonstrable fault and foreseeability of the harm that's caused. Any activist will know the stultifying power of those two deadly words, best practice. So if the common law doesn't stand up for us, for the health and well-being of ordinary people, what about statutes? The 19th and early 20th centuries saw a paternalistic concern for public health, which led to laws such as the Alkali Acts of 18, the 1860s, to inspectorates and regulatory bodies. They were a lot better than nothing, but they can't help us today. Apart from the fact that, of course, most are now entirely anachronistic, they don't change anything about the basic power relationships of predatory capitalism. All they do is hedge it around with a little decorative border. They say, you can continue to exploit people and resources to inflict permanent damage on our health and our, on our environment, just not in these specific ways. And that very specific nature means that they're instantly outdated as corporations find different ways to achieve the same ends. They don't set precedents and they can't be used to establish any wider rights. And they're optional. It's entirely up to the individual government of the day whether it chooses to grant parliamentary time for new legislation. Do we really think, looking at the Westminster and Stormont benches? No. Which leaves us with what? The planning system? Once that had aims that were to do with positive social outcomes, with the common good, but its main purpose in the 21st century is increasingly the mere facilitation of the market. And remember, a Brexit planning system would be one without environmental impact assessments. International law? We're scraping the barrel now. Aspirational is the polite word for most of it. World leaders gather together to tell one another bedtime stories about Never Never Land while well, most of them would fight tooth and nail to prevent its ever coming into existence. Insofar as international law works at all, it works to protect the commercial interests of the rich against the environmental rights of the poor. That, sadly, is the dark truth behind the jolly slogans of the Brexiteers. So-called freedom means license for corporations to enrich themselves, regardless of the externalities of pollution climate change, sickness, and death. And it means the removal from our hands of the few tools we have to build a better future. What are those tools that European membership shares with us? There's the substantive law, of course, half a century's <coughs> worth. Nine years ago, it was calculated that 80% of member states' environmental legislation stemmed from EU policy. That includes countries whose protections go beyond the European minimum. I know, unthinkable, isn't it? So for the UK, it's probably higher. Without those laws and regulations, so cynically dismissed as red, or sometimes green, tape by those whose friends are inconvenienced by them, our health and well-being would dramatically plummet. If it's tape, it's the kind you keep in your first aid kit to stop yourself bleeding to death. But even more important than the specific legislation are, I think, the ideas that inform and shape it. Rather than simply the hedging around of the license to destroy, we're seeing the emergence of environmental human rights. The rights, we might say, of the commons as well as the castle. We see that in the nature of European directives and action programmes, which don't, like the old UK statutes, limit their operation to particular sectors and industries, but integrate them, looking at the total and the cumulative effects. We see it in the principles that the European Union has laid down, that the polluter pays, that development must be sustainable, that the precautionary principle should guide our response to incomplete or ambiguous evidence. We see it in the decisions of the Court of Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights has no specific mention of environmental rights, but we've seen a willingness to interpret Article 8 about respect for private and family life to include the right not to be subject to severe air and noise pollution. 
We've seen that Article 2, the right to life, and Article 10, freedom of expression, can include environmental rights. And critically, that Article 6, the right to a fair hearing, and Article 13, the right to an effective remedy, are relevant to the conduct of regulators and planning authorities, as well as that of the courts. And we see it most clearly in the European implementation of the Aarhus Convention. Without the EU, Aarhus, for us, would be just another well-meaning story. A nice, woolly UN convention following the feel-good Rio Declaration. Its assertion of the environment as a basic human right, linked to the right to life, would be nothing but a pious fiction. And its three pillars, environmental justice, environmental information, and the right to participation, would be about as much use as a cotton wool screwdriver. Now I, along with most of you here, would be the first to say that the implementation of Aarhus, especially here, is very far from being what it should be. And I have no illusions that our enactment and enforcement of European law generally is something to be proud of. If the UK as a whole is something of a malingerer when it comes to the environment, Northern Ireland hasn't got out of its pyjamas yet. <laughs> but we have the tools and we have the rights, and we have real and effective ways of using them. The European doctrine of direct effect says that if our government doesn't transpose European directives properly, we as individuals can still rely on them. And European fines for non-compliance hit the powers that be, especially at Stormont, where it hurts in the wallet. I'd like to see us treat this referendum as a wake-up call not just a dreary rehearsal of the economic pros and cons of Brexit, but a reminder to ourselves and others of the more important, long-lasting and critical aspects of being in Europe. And perhaps that reminder will inspire us in us a determination to use the rights and those remedies which are under threat, to use them for ourselves, for our neighbours, our children and the generations to come. Speakers now, someone texted me from the audience saying, Don't be so rude and, uh, because you're texting. I was actually trying to tweet during the event. <laughs> uh, that's what I was trying to do, but I was so shaken by the text from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, so as James pointed out, I'm clearly not Claire Hanna, but uh, I'll try my best to uh, <laughs> later. So apologies, this is a little bit off the cuff because I, I was kind of asked to do this at uh, very short notice. So if I begin to waffle or lose my thread, then um, just punch me or something. Else. So um, we've heard a lot about European law, and that's of course very, very important. Um, uh, European environment, the law, but just as a slight uh, sidetrack, I'll just say, we also rely a lot on European uh, labour protection laws. So I'm very tempted to say, let's just scrap this and we'll go out and join the, the picket line in solidarity. But um, I'll, I'll stick to the brief. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have been up to Woodburn, the uh, drill site just up, uh, up, up near Carrick Fergus. So the licence for that site was issued in breach of the Strategic Environmental Assessment Directive. So there's European law which applies very, very directly uh, for climate issues that is largely being ignored, but uh, at least there is the potential there for us to have some, some, some sort of remedy through the European courts for that. And I'm confident that uh, uh, the Woodburn site will be defeated and will be defeated through the law, and European law will be the thing that enables us to do that. So maybe I'll just sit down after that. <laughs> so, um, European uh, environmental law to do with climate change and energy is what I'm mostly going to be speaking about. So we have the, um, the UK Climate Change Act, which was the first uh, international, the first national legislation to introduce um, uh, climate change targets. And the impetus for that was, at least to a large extent, the European uh, targets, the 2020-20 targets and things like the 
the emissions trading scheme and various other European uh, targets. And we know that the government is not very keen on climate change targets and on action on climate change generally. So the question then is, if we were to uh, leave EU, how much of the um, how, how, how much could we rely on the government to, to uphold uh, the domestic legislation that we have, the Climate Change Act? I suspect, very little, I suspect we would very rapidly see a uh, rolling back on that. And we've already seen that with uh, renewable energy, for example, where they've been cutting back on, on, uh, on support for that. And again, the impetus for the support in the first place came through European targets. So we see very important uh, driver for uh, climate change action coming through Europe and uh, a reluctance to, to, um, to impose targets or, or to, to enact um, legislation from the current government. Um, uh, we know that uh, green energy, for example, has been on the rise. We've seen a quadrupling of it in the last uh, few years, since about 2008 to 2015, a quadrupling of, of renewable energy. That is unlikely to have happened if it wasn't for European legislation. Um, it's not just an energy though, uh, uh, issues like uh, waste for example. Uh, waste is an enormous uh, uh, source of uh, uh, greenhouse gases um, and again it is uh, increases in recycling or things like uh, end, of life, end of life vehicles directive or uh, landfill directive and waste framework directive. It's things like this that are driving a lot of these the move towards recycling and, to, and towards reducing our waste. And we have seen huge leaps in, in, in uh, our management of waste, a large increase towards recycling, a uh, large reduction in the amount of waste going to uh, landfill, and that is again driven through European legislation. Uh, a lot of these things would not have happened without European law. Um, I, I have written personally uh, complaints on the landfill direction, uh, directive, complaints on the waste framework directive, and that, that's a mechanism, as Boris has said, that's a mechanism of Boris. <laughs> <laughs>